All right, ladies and gentlemen, here is a recap of everything that happened at the PlayStation 5 Showcase event, and I want to compare the PlayStation 5, the PlayStation 5 discless version, to the Series X and the Series S, because there were a lot of things that I didn't know going into this event and researching a little bit more about the specs of these consoles, and of course, they're all coming in at different prices, the Series S at $299, the PlayStation 4 discless version at uh, $399, and then the Series X and the PlayStation 5 main version are both at $499. There were a lot of other incredible announcements. We got a Harry Potter game that looks incredible, and of course, the Black Ops Alpha is out right now exclusively for PlayStation 4. I've been playing that and loving that. I'll get into that a little bit more. And of course, Spider-Man Miles Morales, which is coming out of the PlayStation 4. And I'm not going to lie, that was something I was not expecting. I was expecting that to be a move for them to generate sales for the PS5, but no, Spider-Man Miles Morales is coming out on the PlayStation 4, which is fantastic. And they are remastering Spider-Man PS4 from just 2018. Uh, that's a little weird, but that is the direction the industry is going. What can you do about it? That it's bad or anything, but what you, when you get into the specs of the PlayStation 5, it's not like it's going to be any gigantic improvement necessarily. And let's dive into that right now, actually, before we talk about the games, before we talk about the pre-order disaster that has ensued as a result of this reveal event, let's talk about the specs. So the main thing that you might see right away is that the GPU is more powerful in the Series X with 12 teraflops. And contrarily on the PlayStation 5, it's only 10.28 teraflops, which is still not low or anything, but it is obviously, you know, a good, a good bit lower than the Series X. Additionally, the Xbox Series X has a one terabyte built-in hard drive of internal storage and the PlayStation 5 is at 825 gigabytes. I just like to ask who came up with that number of 825? Like why not 800 or 850? I don't know. That was just a weird number, but whatever. So I've really butchered this because I'm jumping all around this chart. But if you look at CPU, the um, gigahertz processing power of the Xbox Series X is also slightly higher with a 3.8 gigahertz processor, eight Zen two cores. And of course it's the same eight Zen two cores, but it's at a slightly lower gigahertz, 0.3 lower at 3.5 gigahertz. So I was talking with my friend earlier and he's pointing out like, yeah, I mean the Xbox Series X is more powerful and I can't can't wait to get the Series X and this and that. But I mean, the main point that I have to contrast that, which I made several times on this channel and people get very upset when I make the point is what games can we get excited about for the Series X? This console comes out in November and there are zero launch exclusive titles coming out for the game. So of course there are some games coming out in November like Call of Duty that will be playable on the Series X, but their only launch title that they had, which was Halo, is now delayed into 2021. So what is the point in rushing out and getting the Series X or even the Series S when you might already have an Xbox One? I get that this is a pretty substantial upgrade over the prior consoles, and I love what Xbox is doing in terms of integrating their systems into an ecosystem where you can buy one game and you can upgrade it without having to pay with their you know console games. Now, with Call of Duty, you're going to need to pay $10 more to upgrade from the uh, Xbox One to the Series X, but in the case of most of the other games that they have, for example, Halo and other games like that, it's just automatically it transfers up. You buy the game on the Xbox Store, and you can automatically play it on your PC. You see, you can play it on Series X, you can play it on Xbox One, which is fantastic. That is such great consumer-friendly, you know, uh, move for them to make. So I think the problem for the Series X is what is the allure that can get people in? What is that main thing that is going to get people out to go buy the Xbox Series X? I get that they're doing great work with the Game Pass and creating this ecosystem similar to what Apple has with their products, you know, between the Apple Watch, the iPhone, and your laptops. And I love that. I am deep in the Apple ecosystem and I think that the Xbox ecosystem with the games pass as I mentioned and all your Xbox One games just transferring up into Series X which in a way is kind of like a free remaster version of the game albeit not really but you're playing it on a faster system you know 12 T flops as opposed to the Xbox One is a substantial upgrade given that the Xbox One uh, at this point is now from seven plus years old now I thought at first when Xbox came in at the 299 level 300 bucks for a next gen console with a Series S I thought wow that is a huge level up for Xbox but delving a little bit more into the specs about the Series S I do not think that it is that great of a console for Xbox and let me explain why I think that actually the PlayStation 5 discless version the 399 version is going to dominate because what you'll notice is that the main difference in PlayStation first Xbox and their marketing strategy is that the PlayStation 5 and the PlayStation 5 discless version have the exact same specs and the only difference is not having that disc tray and Xbox opted to have a $200 difference dropping the Series S to a low 299 but the problem is the power is just not there for people to justify buying it as a next-gen console. And I hate to break this news for people that were intending to buy the Series S. This might be something that you already know, 
But delving into the specs of this console, the Xbox Series S has four teraflops of GPU power. Keep in mind that, as I mentioned, the Series X has over 12 and the PlayStation 5 has over 10 teflops. This is a substantial reduction in terms of power. Additionally, um, the CPU is pretty comparable, but in terms of the GPU power, it is substantially lower. And then the storage is the 512 gigabytes, which is basically what we've had with the PS3 and the Xbox One. Now, don't get me wrong, this could be a good option for some people. You get what you pay for, and I think that it's good that there is an accessible option for some people that are looking to get into next gen. But four teflops of GPU power, when I can just spend $100 more on a PlayStation 5 and get 10 teraflops and no disk tray, it's basically a $100 upgrade for much improved GPU power and graphics. From a purely specs angle, I think that the PlayStation 5 diskless version for $399 is the best option and probably going to be the most popular of this generation. If you're really into watching Blu-ray on your PlayStation 5, I certainly can envision a world in which you utilize that and get the $500 version of the console, but I don't foresee the Xbox Series X for $500 selling very well. And it was interesting because I was talking to one of my friends about it. He's like, yeah, you know, the Series X is so powerful and it's $500. But then I started thinking about it. I was like, dude, this weekend we're playing Black Ops Cold War the alpha exclusively on PlayStation right now, we would not be able to play this if we were on Xbox. And not only that, we wouldn't even be able to play Halo because this friend in particular is really big into Halo. But I just think that there is a huge advantage in the strategy that Sony is utilizing and putting the games first. Yes, the T-flops, you know, slightly lower. It's 10 and a half instead of 12, whatever. But is that really going to be the big difference maker? We can notice back into the different console generations and the console wars between both of the consoles. And of course, in the case of PlayStation 3, it was dominated by the Xbox 360 for the vast majority of its life cycle. Now, at the very end, when PlayStation started cutting costs of the PlayStation 3, it actually, at the very end, ended up selling more than the Xbox 360. But for the vast majority of the time, many, many more people owned Xbox 360s and PlayStation 3s. This is despite the fact that the PlayStation 3 was the more powerful console over the Xbox 360, but they had the games, they had the Call of Duty DLC deals, they had the exclusive games, Gears of War was big, Halo was big. They had all of that, and PlayStation had a few really good story games, but it just wasn't as big compared to the way first-person shooter games were dominating the market back in that, you know, uh, early 2000s era. Can't underestimate how much of a big deal Halo was, how influential that was in driving sales for Xbox and Gears of War, and all of that, and they, they just did a great job marketing in that era. And then you jump over to the PlayStation 4, and the PlayStation 4 came in $100 beneath the Xbox, and that was ultimately its undoing. So the Series S does have a substantial advantage over the PlayStation, but I think just going back to that conversation with my friend, you know, okay, we get the Series X, we get the Series S, now what? What do we play? And of course, you have those third party games, you have Call of Duty you can play, although you have advantages of owning the game on PlayStation, and uh, Halo's coming, maybe, hopefully. And uh, if, if anyone's really into Halo anymore, which is not that not that many people compared to, you know, The Last of Us compared to these other games that PlayStation is pumping out Spider-Man Miles Morales, which I think are going to drive even more sales. OK, but one thing working against PlayStation is the pre-order disaster that has ensued. And it's nothing short of a disaster. I mean, basically, they had announced a couple weeks ago that there is going to be no surprises and you guys are going to know in advance when the PlayStation 5 goes on sale, and then they had the PlayStation 5 showcase event. They said that pre-orders were going to go up tomorrow at the day of the press conference, and then that day, a couple hours later, Walmart was sold out of PlayStation 5s, and we were all like, what the hell? Like, I thought you guys said that it was not going to be a surprise. I thought you said that we were going to have plenty of warning of when this was going to happen, and that ended up not being totally true. Now, I don't know who is to absolve the blame for that. I can imagine a world in which Walmart is solely responsible for that error, and they were not supposed to be doing that. But I also think that PlayStation probably dropped the ball on that and were complicit in that disaster. Just a big letdown, and PlayStation actually published a tweet today apologizing for the whole debacle, but it's something that fans are not going to get over very easily because they were really waiting and they wanted to make sure they get their pre-order in, and the console's already pretty much sold out everywhere. And that's going to be a huge issue for me because I also was not able to secure a PlayStation 5 pre-order because, I mean, you know, Walmart sold out in 10 minutes and we never got any warning and it was supposed to be like, oh, you're going to know in advance, you're going to know the date, you're going to know the time so we could secure the console. I'm not that worried about it. I think that on the whole, you know, I'll probably be able to pick one up 
here in a couple months and I think it'll be fine. Part of what they do as well is it's it's a bit of a game where they're putting pressure on you, the consumer, of like it's gonna sell out so quickly, you gotta go buy it, you gotta go buy it. And that's part of their marketing strategy. And, and then of course in November, if you go to GameStop or you go to Walmart, then there's plenty of them on the stair, uh, on the shelves. You might have to fight for them then too. You might have to fucking beat a few people up on Black Friday to get one, but they'll still be there. So of course, these are not the only PlayStation 5s that will be sold this winter. They are just intentionally making it appear as though this is all they have and Walmart sold out in 10 minutes, but they have plenty more that they're going to be selling. So I'm not that worried about it, although yeah, it might be a little difficult to get your hands on a PlayStation 5. That's the other thing is I just don't imagine this rush of people to buy the Series X because there's not any enticing, you know, exclusives coming out for the console in November. Uh, contrarily on the PlayStation 5, we do have Spider-Man Miles Morales, which is a $40 game. Now, we're going to delve into the games a little bit more, but let's let's continue talking about this. Well, thanks to Sony's fantastic work on their launch uh, disaster here, they are now selling PlayStation 5s on eBay for $5,000, $5,279 plus shipping. The shipping's not included on that $5,000 markup on a console that costs 500 bucks so that's a great profit margin for that guy congratulations but uh, ultimately i think people that do this are kind of scumbags and please nobody do not buy a playstation 5 for five grand on ebay that is just the dumbest thing for one you're probably getting scammed and number two even if you're not the hardware you can build for five thousand dollars you could build like the best gaming pc ever made in human history and instead you're buying a console with with 10 teraflops i mean it's just absurd so do not do that and do not buy a PlayStation 5 on eBay and just wait until it comes out for $4.99 again. It'll be restocked around November when they're really trying to get your money. As he said, this is mostly a marketing gimmick of planned obsolescence in a sense where they're trying to limit the amount of consoles that are sold. They're trying to say, oh, it's a limited amount. You got to buy quickly. And even it worked on me because I was kind of in that position where I was like, OK, I'll just wait till November when the game or when the console fully launches and everything like that instead of pre-ordering. But, of course, they want to make you feel like the time is running out and you've got to get it right now. So, in response to Walmart's tweet on the matter, there was a user that said, How is this fair? PlayStation puts out that pre-orders don't start till tomorrow. You start them now with no warning, so people get on and not know that they are sold out almost immediately. Super disappointed. As I said, PlayStation later came out and said, Well, we made a huge mistake. We apologize about that. But there's also this really hilarious graphic from this guy named Moy. Sorry, you were too fucking slow. Go enjoy your PlayStation 4 now. It's hilarious. Here's the other angle of this that you really don't consider. I mean, as I mentioned, I do not foresee the Series X launching to mass sellouts or anything like that. It's certainly possible, but I don't foresee that happening. And, and given that context, I think that the launch of the PlayStation 5, although it appears like a disaster, it appears like PlayStation really screwed up, what it shows is that the demand for this console is extremely high. And even though it was a mix up, you know, launching the console too early and pre orders too early, I think it's actually going to work in PlayStation's favor. Is it a disaster? Somewhat. But as I mentioned, it shows high value and interest in the product, and it ultimately creates this effect wherein everybody knows that, wow, the PlayStation 5 sold out so quickly, and so many people are trying to get it, and I need to get a hold of mine, and blah, blah, blah. It's like a huge marketing frenzy of people just rushing to go buy their console and i think that it ultimately benefits playstation even though they didn't handle it perfectly it sounds crazy but i genuinely do believe that this is going to be a huge advantage for playstation 5 nobody is not going to buy the playstation 5 because of this nobody is going to say ah you know screw it i'm now getting my xbox series x like the people that still wanted a ps5 are still going to get it they're just going to have to jump through extra hoops to get it there might be a small number of people who claim online that they are going to get a Xbox instead of a PlayStation 5 because of this launch debacle, but I highly, highly uh, would, would theorize that very few people are going to switch which console they're planning to get. Everyone that still wanted a PS5 is still going to get it, and this is just a huge PR bonus for a PlayStation, in fact, because it signals the high interest and value that people have in the PlayStation 5 console, whereas I think the Xbox launch will be pretty flat comparatively. And the fact that so many people care about getting their PlayStation 5 pre-ordered this quickly is just the highest compliment that Sony could even receive. Now, in terms of the designs of both of these consoles, I think that both are fairly ugly. One thing that really struck me about the Series X is that it's actually a lot smaller than I thought when I saw people unboxing it and that type of thing. I was like, wow, that is not nearly as big as I thought it would be. And I think that the same is true of the PlayStation 5, although the PlayStation 5 is substantially bigger than the Series X. I think that the 
PlayStation 5 does not have a great design in the sense that I can't lay it on my side or stand it up. I think that with the PlayStation 4, you have that liberty where you could stand it up if you want to. It's not advised, but certainly laying it on its side is probably the way that most people utilize the console. In this case, it has to stand up vertically, which I'm not a big fan of. I don't know about you, but I think that it's just easier to lay the console vertically. That is certainly what uh, I do with the Xbox One and the PlayStation 4. So having this really, really tall vertical console that kind of looks like a router where it sort of angles up towards the top and takes up even more space is not the best design, although it was very intentional. What I heard, had heard from Dustin, who's an expert on consoles and all this stuff and, you know, PlayStation and Xbox is that there is a vent system where air filters in on one side and comes out the other side because one of the biggest issues with the PlayStation 5 that we all know is that it is incredibly loud. And I think that's because the vents are primarily on the sides and in the back, but there's no airflow in pushing air out the back. It's like a, a one-sided thing where air is just being pushed out, and that's why the fan is so loud. So this should be a much, much quieter console, although I wouldn't be surprised if it's extremely loud like the PlayStation 4 is currently. But that is one huge advantage that the Xbox One had over the PlayStation 4. I felt that it was much quieter and much more efficient in that way. I mean this sincerely for the chat. Is this something that will sway you away from buying a PlayStation 5? Are you now switching to buying an Xbox Series X because um, Xbox is throwing shade at PlayStation on Twitter for the way that they handled this? And I think that some fans may want to reconsider their choice, but I, I highly doubt that because, again, the game catalogs and the exclusives on PlayStation far outmatch that of Xbox that, as I mentioned, this is not the case in the Xbox 360 generation. And it's it's difficult to make comparisons from this generation to past generations like the Xbox 360 versus PS3 gen, which was a very highly contested generation in the sense that console sales were pretty much neck and neck. Uh, and in the end, PlayStation 3 actually ended up winning, which was the console that was losing all along in the so-called console war. As I mentioned at the top of the podcast, we had already had Halo, Gears of War, Call of Duty exclusive DLC, and that is just at the tipping point of the first-person shooter genre, not getting into the other advantages that the Xbox 360 had so they were fierce and vicious in scooping up that DLC exclusive games and that type of stuff and they really prioritize first party games now they're going towards the game pass model I just don't feel that being as uh, sexy and alluring to fans for more hardcore gamers that want a complete package they want to play old games from Xbox 360 and they really love the ecosystem you know a perfect example of this again is my friend Dustin co-host of the anonymous throwdown podcast the Xbox Series X is perfect for him because it creates that seamless transition. You can have a huge game catalog of hundreds of games. It all syncs perfectly into the cloud. You can play them on your PC. It's just a perfect system for that type of person. For me in particular, you know, I just want to play Spider-Man Miles Morales. I need to play that game. I'm a YouTuber for the game. So that's something that I'm going to be buying now. I am curious to know that Spider-Man Miles Morales now transitioning into the game side of things. Spider-Man Miles Morales is coming out on the PlayStation 4. Now, of course, it's not clear the extent to which the graphics will vary between the PlayStation 4 and the PlayStation 5 version. Will there be issues with pop-up loading and the distance in New York City? If that's the case, it might be worth biting the bullet and getting the PlayStation 5 right away. Otherwise, it could be worthwhile waiting a little bit till the price drops and that PlayStation 5 discless version could go down even to the 299 number later in 2021. Not particularly likely, considering that they're already selling the console at a loss, but it's something that's worth considering, you know, next November, it wouldn't surprise me if there are huge bundle deals. At the very least, they're going to be selling the console for the same price with games as a bundle. Right now, if you drop the $399, you're just going to be getting the console. A year from now in November, if you could possibly wait that long, then you're going to be able to get a game or two in a console for that same price in a bundle. So that's worth considering, you know, as I mentioned, Spider-Man Miles Morales is coming out on the PlayStation 4. Spider-Man PS4 is being remastered for the PlayStation 5. That's something, again, I'm not sure how much value that is going to add to us because that is making Spider-Man Miles Morales, which is a $50 game, a little bit more like a story DLC expansion pack is the best way to describe it, similar to Uncharted Lost Legacy. So I'm keeping my hopes pretty balanced for that game. I'm excited for it. I think it'll be a fun experience, but I don't know if we can even call it a game. The fact that they're selling it for 40 bucks is a pretty substantial red flag that this is going to have less content than the Spider-Man PS4 game. That's something that we knew all along, and I'm not saying that's bad. I'm not saying that we shouldn't buy the game as a result of that or anything like that. But it's just something to keep in mind and to keep our expectations leveled of what that game is actually providing for us. It's going to be a little bit more like a story DLC, again, Uncharted Lost Legacy type expansion pack than an actual game, and the price tag 
clearly shows that. Now, I think for some people, like my good friend Evan Falarka, it's going to be fully worth buying the PlayStation 5, getting the best version of that console, and then getting Miles Morales game on that, get the best version of that game in terms of the uh, FPS and the graphics and all of that, and then also getting the remaster for on PS4, which I'm certain he will 100% again as soon as he is able to get his hands on a PlayStation 5. So for someone like me that's a little bit less hardcore into the Spider-Man games, I will probably actually play Miles Morales on PS4 and do all my video content from there because the PlayStation 4 is still a console that holds up pretty well, and I just don't see the reason to participate in the frenzy, especially when PlayStation has botched their releasement to the extent in which they have. I don't see the incentive in rushing out to go buy a console at full price when, as I mentioned, you know, going into next year, it's going to be discounted anyway. With that being said, I probably still am going to get PS5 this November, but um, in terms of the Series X, I'm probably not planning on purchasing that console. Unless Halo Infinite really wows me in 2021, I might get it on a discount and look into getting games passed and that type of thing. Um, one thing that's really interesting about what Xbox is doing is they're actually having like a payment layaway plan where you can pay 35 bucks a month, get the Series X, you get Game Pass, and you get Xbox Live, all for 35 bucks a month. You pay $35 per month for two years, and I assume that it requires credit approval and it's like a legit loan on your Xbox, which is a little bit weird. I personally wouldn't recommend partaking in that, although it seems like a good idea, you know, of course. Uh, global pandemics can happen and then you can't put up the 35 bucks and then you're kind of screwed so also i just think that you know putting a console on a payment plan um it just is a little risky so uh because the console could break i mean who knows you, you could just spill water on it and then you still have to pay payments on it every month so i think it's better to just pay up front if at all possible that is a very interesting model that could you know not only compete with the payment plans that walmart and target try to get you on but it also um, just could be a way for more people that can't afford a next-gen console right now to pay like, oh yeah, okay, I'll put 25 bucks a month down for the Series S, I'll put down 35 on the Series X, and the great thing about it is that you get everything included, you know, you get the Game Pass and you also get Xbox Live. Um, maybe Game Pass isn't included on that, can somebody please correct me in the comment section below, I honestly don't know if Game Pass is included. One of the biggest reveals that caught me off guard was Hogwarts, uh, Legacy of Hogwarts. That game looks absolutely fantastic. I love the setting of it. You know, one of the biggest problems with the Harry Potter games in the past, of which I'm familiar with almost all of them, I played them quite a bit and I really enjoyed them. The problem with them is that they utilized, you know, Harry Potter and Ron and Hermione and these characters and they would get other voice actors and it, would, it just never really worked, you know, because we were no used to the normal voice actors or the real, you know, Harry Potter actors from the main movies were kind of like phoning in in the games and it was really awkward dialogue that was poorly written so I think it's a great idea to do essentially what the most recent Star Wars game did and basically d devolve away a little bit from the main canon that we all know stay away from Harry Potter I hope that we see lots of allusions to the main books and the movies that we've come to love particularly um, Voldemort I believe he was alive in the late 1800s I could be wrong about that but I'm pretty certain he is uh, if not we could see his origin story like Voldemort's origin origin story Dumbledore's origin story that would be really really cool um, I believe also Dumbledore would be very very young at that time it might be pushing it because in Fantastic Beasts they established him as being in his early 20s and that's in the early 1900s I think not the late 1800s so maybe not we'll just have to see but I love the way that the game looked there have been so many you know Harry Potter games in the past that have been close but no cigar like there's not been a great Harry Potter game and it's one of those things like we need a Batman Arkham for Harry Potter and the same way that we have Batman Arkham for Batman we need that equivalent for Harry Potter and I think that this game will provide that I mean the game looks absolutely phenomenal the map looks incredible and a free roam Hogwarts game open world MMORPG create your own character I mean that just all looks incredible I cannot wait for the Harry Potter game that's coming out in 2021 and by the way that's by Warner Brothers so then that asks the interesting question well when are they going to be targeting a release on that probably November of 2021 which means that Gotham Knights this could be surreptitiously confirming that they're aiming for a summer reveal for Gotham Knights because they can't have two WB games come out at the same time you know they're going to want to space them out a little bit and what that's going to entail is basically either Gotham Knights or Harry Potter are going to be coming out in the summer. Again, if I had to guess, because Gotham Knights was revealed first, we're going to see Gotham Knights in the summer, and we're going to see Harry Potter in November. I believe a new Fantastic Beast movie also is slated to come out in November of 2021. That might have been delayed, but... And the sad thing about that is that, you know, Fantastic Beast has been such a letdown for the Harry Potter brand, and this is exactly what we need as Harry Potter fans to revive the franchise. Like, great video games 
more than anything else, can revive an entire character and an entire franchise. And I think that that is what will happen. Also, J.K. Rowling is constantly getting canceled for a lot of different things. People are calling her transphobic and fatphobic, and she people are burning her books online. And on TikTok, that's like a new trend where people are burning Harry Potter books. So this is something that might be able to course correct, I guess, the Harry Potter franchise a little bit because there's going to be a lot of positive support around this game, especially if it is going to be what we think it is. Again, like you know, uh, to the extent of a Last of Us or a Batman Arkham in terms of quality. If that is true, and it looks like it is true, you know, this game is going to be incredible. It's going to be so much fun. It's going to elevate Harry Potter in the video game uh, sphere, which is something that it's not really had. And um, there's so much depth that can be built upon here, and I cannot wait to see what they do with the game. I will also say that Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War, the mission that they show, which is the opening mission of the game, looks absolutely incredible and it's that classic call of duty action that has made the franchise what it is when they're chasing that airplane with the rcxd car it explodes the propeller flies everywhere i mean it's just incredible action and it, like the call of duty black ops franchise when it comes to black ops versus modern warfare this could be a whole new podcast on its own regarding the story and which story is better but it's it's really difficult to say but each offers something totally unique and different with the call of duty black ops it has those mind-bending narrative plots about it and we had jfk and black ops 1 which was incredibly cool especially that part where you like pick up your handgun it looks like you're about to try to kill jfk that part literally like blew my mind so there's so much to look forward to in this game focusing more on the 80s and the ronald reagan era i think that treyarch has a real thing for history i have studied history in college so i'm also really into it really digging it so i cannot wait to see more about call of duty black ops cold war as i mentioned i've been playing the alpha over the weekend there's some strengths and weaknesses to that again that could be a whole other podcast delving into but i think that the there's only one good map that is satellite which is the desert map the other maps are not looking great uh, the miami map it looks really cool but it doesn't play particularly well it has some of the issues of the modern warfare maps the killstreak selection is pretty limited in the in the alpha thus far but i imagine that will expand in the full game overall there's a lot of promise in the game i'm just waiting to see a little bit more but the gunplay is really good i like the time to kill i like the uh, perk options Overall, it's been a fun experience. I'm just waiting to see more and to see what exactly they have in store for us this year. But I'm so glad to see that we have a single player returning. To me, like Call of Duty and single player, it's something that is always really pivotal to the story. I remember when the PlayStation servers went down for like three weeks back when I was a PlayStation 3 user about 10 years ago. And the servers went down for like a month. I just replayed the Call of Duty single player stories over and over and over again. And the way the action pieces are set up it, and, and the story is also quite good in both the Modern Warfare franchise and in the Call of Duty Black Ops franchise. So this is another soft reboot similar to what Modern Warfare did. We'll have to wait and see exactly how it looks in terms of the single player, but overall I am excited. So guys, what did you think about the PlayStation 5 showcase event where they showed off a bunch of new games and more details about the console? Let me know what you thought about this video in the comment section below. Be sure to give the video a thumbs up. Shout out to all of my elite members. And uh, if you want to become a member yourself, check the link in the description below. And you can join for only 5 bucks a month. You get a bonus video every single Sunday. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. My name is Slickmoff. I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace out.